Welcome to the show, Scott. Glad to have you. Thanks for having me, man. And as I already told you, but I'm now going to tell all of your listeners, I'm extremely jealous. Ray is sitting in Mexico right now. Be able to see the beach outside of his window. It's really, I'm, I'm, I don't feel good right now, Ray. I feel like I'm losing it. You're winning. Cool. Well, I, I'll resist the urge to turn the, the monitor and show you. <clears throat> I was watching dolphins and whales from my office, uh, oh, for last, God's sake. last week. Yeah. It's That's not helping, right? It's, oh, you know what? Yeah. But is that why you, you wore the, you wore the surf hat though? Like you're. Well, I, I mean, I always wear the, so I have like, how many of these I have? I have two or three of these and uh, you know, I just kind of rotate depending on my meat. Today it's kind of a red, white, bluish vibe. Patriotic surf. Yeah. Yeah. For today. There we go. Uh, well, <clears throat> you will, uh, we'll, we'll dive into a little bit more on, on surfing here in, in, in just a bit, man. Um, but I like just kick things off for listeners. Like what's your, what's your sales story? How'd you get into to sales and into sales leadership? Yeah. You know, I'm not normal way, although maybe the abnormal way is the normal way now, meaning so many of us just fall into this profession. Um, I, I wasn't a business person growing up. I, I wasn't kind of, a, I was not like a high school kid who was entrepreneurial, like thinking of business ideas or any of that stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting up there in years and I'll, I'm probably the last generation that got through college without having an email address. <laughs> I like wasn't, you know, computers and tech was just like, not my thing. Right. Um, I ended up in sales after a, a long hospitalization. Yeah. You know, I was 23 years old and, uh, had just finished graduate school and ended up super sick and, and spent the better part of four years, uh, in and out of hospitals across a couple of different states, uh, battling different autoimmune diseases, colon cancer scare, and, uh, had nine major surgeries, four life saving surgeries, two emergency surgeries, and got addicted to opioids in the process, had to kick off dope. So, you know, I was 27 years old before I ever started a career and before I ever, you know, tried my hand at, at selling anything. Um, and I, I saw sales as the only vehicle I could think of legally where I could make up for lost time and how well I did, uh, sort of dictated how much I would earn, right? The better I did, the more I get paid. If I do badly. You get fired. And as an athlete, I played two sports in college for four years. Like as an athlete, I understood that, that competitiveness, right? Like you do well, you get paid, you don't, you're gone. I'm like, all right, well, that makes sense. Let me, let me see if I can, you know, I can make this work. And I had a friend or two, maybe even at the time who were in sales in some capacity, um, and they were doing pretty good. And I'm like, well, if so-and-so can, can make this work. Maybe I can make it work. So. And then I, I went to a startup on purpose as opposed to a big corporate ed- entity because, uh, you know, I felt like I wanted to be a part of something, you know, going back to wanting to be a part of a team. I've been at teams my whole life. Like I go to a little startup. I feel like I matter. I mean something on this team. I have access to different people. Maybe I can move up fast. Those were the things, you know, kind of going through my head. And so that's how I got started in sales and, um, and. I did, I did pretty well, pretty quick and got pushed into leadership pretty quick. And, um, you know, the rest is kind of history, as they say, I've been building and scaling sales teams uh, as an operator for 16 years or so, and as a consultant and an, an advisor for a, uh, for a couple of years now. Awesome. <clears throat> Man, there's a lot of, a lot in there. Um, one of the questions I was, I was going to ask, and, and you had, you brought this up, um, on the, on the opo- opioids and, and breaking that. And I, I read that you, you did that like straight cold Turkey. I mean, just yeah. ro- rode that out and, and yeah. you know, the, the recovery at home, how, I mean, how impactful was that experience on where you are today? It, very impactful in, in a lot of ways that I didn't know at the time, right? Um, you talk a lot about resiliency in sales. You talk a lot about, uh, you know, setbacks and and failing. You talk a lot about mindset and willpower, right? Well, I mean, if you haven't gone through any kind of struggle with addiction, that 
it's, it's potentially difficult for you to understand the amount of willpower required and willpower on its own is not enough for, for most people. It, it breaks you. Um, and since they have been so sick for so long and then have to, to get off of drugs, it was like, almost like going back to square one in a way. Like, oh, I just defeated this, you know, demon. What the fuck is this? This is like boss level demon tanks too now. Right. Um, but I got lucky if, if I'm being honest, I keep that because the medicine, the, the, the narcotics that I was taking were medicine to deal with the pain from me being in the hospital all these years and what I was going through. Um, it wasn't me medicating or self-medicating, you know, to deal with emotional pain. Um, or, or trauma or things like that. So I think a lot of the mental addiction piece didn't afflict me as much as the physical addiction did. So, you know, by the time that I was healed and healthy from the illnesses and I just had the drugs to, to deal with, my mindset was, okay, well, I have walked through hell for four years. I know about drugs. If I stop taking these pills and drinking this liquid morphine that I've been drinking for four years, like I'm going to go through train spotting for a couple of weeks. But my mindset was a couple of weeks is nothing I can endure. I've endured so much. Like what's the big deal about a couple of weeks of hell? And you know, the, the, the hospital UCSF hospital was like super adamant that I shouldn't try to call Turkey. And my mom was a nurse is like, you shouldn't try to call Turkey. I had to sign these, uh, against doctor's orders papers for UCF, UCSF. Yep. I see your eyes raised. I had to sign them basically. So I wouldn't, you know, my family wouldn't sue if anything happened, you know, when I was trying to, to get off the drug. So, you know, I, I, I went home and, uh, you know, just kind of locked myself in my room and it was a brutal couple of weeks physically. I, I had people who were trying to enable me candidly like, well, here, why don't you take one to take this, take that, like lessen the blow and I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, I don't even want to take a fucking Advil ever again in my life. That was my, that was my mindset. So all of that stuff prepared me, I think mentally for the roller coaster of selling, the, the rejection, the, you know, the threat of losing your job or losing your job and the starting of new ventures after you built something that was you know, pretty successful having to go back to the beginning and start over. And it gives you the perspective of like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Mm -hmm. right? It's like, I've already been, hopefully knock on wood through the worst thing and I'll ever go through in my life. So what do I care if this prospect hangs up on me? What do I care if this deal doesn't come back? Right? What do I care if my boss fires me? Oh, well, I'll get another job, big deal. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and having that kind of mindset, I think frees you up and liberates you, um, and it allows you to kind of move forward in life with a little bit less fear and take more chances, you know, and gives you some confidence. That's like, I can go through anything, right? <clears throat> yeah. We all know the, the state of mind that you're in, if you're, if you're selling, when you're, when you're overly concerned about the next deal, <clears throat> overly concerned about losing your job, overly concerned about yeah. it, it just, it completely changes the way that you, you approach it. Um, why well, I say, I mean, congratulations to you. And it takes a lot of courage, especially to, 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 to not take advice from doctors and then go through and, and barrel through it. Is there reflecting on what you went through? I mean, obviously if I'm listening to this, obviously not the experience that I'm going to have, but if I'm, if I'm going to try to prepare myself mentally for the roller coaster that is sales, are there any, is there anything you recommend, um, that maybe isn't, isn't quite as as enduring as something like that yeah. for, for these, these are, please don't go through what I went through right. to learn how to wait to that. Um, you know, I think, I think everybody, no matter who you are, we've all been through shit and trauma and hell and the things that seem impossible. If you hear me talk, if I heard you talk about what you've been through in your life, it might sound impossible to me. And I might be over here and like, I don't know how Ray made it through that. I, I couldn't, couldn't have done that. So I, I think what you do, everybody does is you've got to draw back on the hardships and challenges that you've already made it through in your life. 
right? And realize probably dealing with the roller coaster of selling is not that big a deal or not the hardest thing in the grand scheme of things, right? Talk about people who come from broken homes, survived addiction or abuse, right? I, I, I moved all over the world, right? And, and had to like uproot their, their whole lives, all this kind of stuff. And it's so much harder than selling. So if you can kind of come back to the core of who you are and be like, yeah, I'll be okay. I can get through this. So what if these people tell me, no, I've proved people wrong my whole life. Right. And you kind of, kind of adopt that, uh, that mindset, even if you have to kind of create this chip on your shoulder, right. Where you're like, the world's out to get me. Everybody's trying to, you know, hold me down. Like, I, okay, I'm going to be stopped. Right. Me against the world. If that's, if that's what it takes, I'm going to prove you raw. All of those kind of things I think can and should funnel into how you approach, you know, the difficult moments selling or leading sales teams and things like that. And, and as an athlete, I also always come back to, you know, how quickly you have to have a, how quickly you have to forget things, you gotta have a short memory, right? You know, I talk about a quarterback who throws a pick six, throws an interception. You better forget about that. Cause if you're still thinking about that interception, when you break tunnel, you know, next time you have the ball, you're a big trouble. I put the college tennis. Tennis is one of, alongside golf, I think, in my opinion, the most mentally taxing sports that there is. You have I mean, hundreds of opportunities every single match to feel like dirt because you've made mistakes and you have no teammates to blame it on at all. Right. And so, you know, you, you miss a shot, you double fall, like you gotta forget about it and move on to the next thing. So I, I think if you can draw back on some of these experiences in your life, you know, personal experiences or sporting experiences, whatever, I just think it helps give you perspective required to understand that, you know, you're going to fail 99 times out of a hundred as a salesperson. And that's okay. That doesn't mean you're terrible. That means you're going to be great if you just do it longer. Mm -hmm. Do you think, so you mentioned the athletics piece a couple of times mm -hmm. and I did, I was, I was, I was into sports. I've done a lot of martial arts and I've noticed with there it's been, I think it's been a commonality with a lot of high performers in sales. Is that something that you have found or that you would look for or, or is that it, it, it has been, it has been a commonality for a long time, you know, and there's even been studies on it. I, somewhere I remember reading that, um, in sales, the sport that had the highest overall corner attainment was wrestling. Hmm. I don't exactly remember why, but individual sport spotlights on you the whole time, right? You win, you're praised, you lose, like you are publicly shamed because you just got your ass full of <laughs> right? Um, but there's a lot of other disciplines and activities that I think lend themselves just as well. And, and some of those are starting to get more attention as they should. There's a lot of people who are musicians who got into sales. You're on stage, you got to perform. There's a lot of people who are actors who are in theater. You got to go into character. You got to, you know, read sales scripts and whatnot. Groupon is famously known for when they first got started hiring a bunch of uh, stand-up comics in the Chicagoland area. Why? Well, comics are charming. Comics, comics build rapport, right? You make people, people laugh. So it doesn't have to just be athletics. There's just so many different activities, debate club, speech and debate club. I've talked to a couple of people recently from Gong who uh, had experience in speech and debate, same kind of thing, crafting arguments, competing, right? Um, I think that's maybe it's, it's getting more, uh, how do I phrase this? It's less about, oh, Ray is an athlete, we got to hire him. And it's more about what has Ray done and participated in that potentially shaped his personality where he might be a successful seller. And it could be sport, it could be performance, it could be all these different things. Um, and that's helping, I think, with some of the, the diversity, um, that is kind of coming, you know, into sales and into sales leadership. And it's a long time coming and there's a long way to go, but it's good to see some of this stuff happening. That actually, it leads me to something that I've, <clears throat> I've heard you talking about recently, and it is the, the industry experience. <clears throat> so when you're, when you're looking at a, you know, for 
whether it's an SDR, AE, even a sales manager. And there's a lot of must have, you know, five years industry experience, but there's, I mean, as you're pointing out, you know, whether it's comedy or athletics or, you know, academics, there are so many other things that can shape who you are and whether you're going to be successful in the role other than industry experience. Um, can you just, I guess for, for the audience, just tell what is, what is your, your kind of your position on, on that, on that approach to recruiting and, and can you just explain kind of your, your yeah. perspective on that? Yeah, I, I can do it in two words. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a horrible, horrible perspective. Um, companies have for too long optimized for industry experience over acumen, over sales acumen. Um, and I never understood that. And it doesn't have to be just at the SDRA level. Listen, the last company, Ray, that I was an operator at, um, as you probably know, is this company called Quali. It's a property tech company. So title insurance software to title insurance companies, uh, you know, real estate attorneys, underwriters, people like this. Let me ask you a question. Before I took this job, do you think I had experience in the title insurance industry? Probably not five years of it. Zero. Ray. Zero. Zero. I didn't even know what the fuck title insurance is. <laughs> okay. So that company now we're worth, we're worth a couple billion dollars. Okay. Now when I'm, when I'm figuring out how to pitch the product and position it, how to go to market, right. Um, I had to learn all this stuff, but it's far easier for me to learn an industry and learn a product than it is for me to learn how to sell. Right. So. As I went to hire and recruit salespeople for my team, do you think I'm trying to peel people from the title insurance industry? No, I'm looking for people who know how to sell, who know how to use modern sales tactics and modern sales tools, who've been in the startup in a fast paced, high growth environment before. Those are the things that I want because that's way more to, harder to teach than to teach somebody about an industry. Learning about the title insurance industry is like going back to school and taking a course. It's just like book smart, right? Like I, I get you materials and say, go memorize these terms. Mm -hmm. I can't say, Hey, go memorize, like how to pitch, how to story tell. It, it doesn't work the same. It's much harder to teach. So I, I just, it absolutely sucks when I see those, you know, job ads that's like, must have five years in the, you know, CPG space. Must have five years in retail. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, if I applied for that job, are you not going to hire me because I have no retail sales experience? Like, I've been a, you know, I've done a lot in my career. I'm pretty sure I can figure out how to sell retail if that is one is requiring me. So I, I, I preach all the time, acumen, not in the industry experience. And how do you, if you're a sales manager and you're hearing this and you say, you know, I'm, this doesn't make any sense. I'm going to, I'm going to look for acumen. What is acumen? How do you, how do you define it for your unique business? Somebody who knows how to sell somebody who has some experience, demonstrable experience selling in a modern kind of sales environment, selling software or selling hardware with Maybe a similar type of a sales cycle, whether it's transactional and more enterprise. People who have experience with a CRM, an enablement tool, conversational, you know, intelligent tool like Gong. People who've been in startup environments before. People who've been in large company environments before. Like, there's so many other things. A history of quota attainment. Uh, like, you know, good references or referrals, right? Things like that. Those things matter way more to me. Then, oh, Ray is like, you know, been in the real estate industry forever. Well, you know what happens if I hire people to qualia and come from the title industry, in the insurance industry, they've got 20 years of baggage and they're going to tell me it won't work that way, Scott. It always has worked this way. And they're not going to be open to any kind of new ideas. When I, when I got started at qualia, everybody told me you cannot sell unless you are face to face in the title insurance industry. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's interesting, uh, because I've built and scaled inside sales organizations, my whole career. And that's what I intend to do here. And I don't think there's any, ever been anybody like me 
who's trying to scale a inside sales team inside this industry. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to do it. And, and that's what I'm going to do. And I so I hired people who didn't know any better. I hired people who sold inside like me before. We had been at other tech companies before and we made it happen. And we, you know, defied all of those like industry experts, right? <clears throat> a blank coachable slate goes a lot further than the 20 years of experience. <clears throat> you know, it's the, it's, yeah. the, it's the baggage. It's the, it's the way we've always done it. It's, you know, there are, if they, if they haven't seen it done another way for 20 years, if you're introduced, especially if you, know, you, you work with a lot of startups who are changing, they're, they're disrupting markets. So bringing some of that old baggage in, I imagine is even less impactful in a, in a startup. Well, yeah, it's, it's the opposite of what I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, like, so you, you mentioned that you went to a startup on purpose early in your, in, in their sales career and. One of the things that I've talked to people about is the, the small nature gives you a lot more, a lot more leeway. You have a bigger impact, things like that. Um, but the pushback I get is the failure rate. I'm like, yeah, that's true. But you know, I don't know how much money these, this startup really has. I don't really know what they're doing. The failure rates really high. Then I'm going to be bouncing around. How would you, how would you pick a startup if you were, if you were looking for a role today or evaluator to just do some, some due diligence? I feel like I first wanted to rebut that whole argument, but I'm going to refrain from rebutting the argument that, that no, really, no, rebut it. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to get all fired up. Uh, I'm going to pick a startup. Um, I think there's never, it's never been easier to know kind of the background of a startup. Like all of the financial information is available now. Like 20 years ago, when I was getting started, there was no like, crunch base where I could read, you know, Ray.com has raised 10 million in a series A, right? So not knowing how much money somebody has in the bank, um, it's kind of inexcusable to me. Like you, you just haven't done your diligence. You haven't done your research. Um, so that, so that's one thing that I, I look for is like, are they funded or are they bootstrapped and what's their kind of cash position and situation? Uh, Depending on the size, I look to see who the, who the team is, who the leaders are, right? So if I saw your name as the VP of sales at this tech startup, to me, that's instant credibility. And so now I'm more interested. So if I'm just in my early career and I'm, I pay attention, I listen to podcasts like this, uh, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, I, I follow people who've been in the game for a while. I, I have my favorites of, you know, who's, which people's advice I take and whatnot. I'm trying to go look for one of them. I'm trying to deep risk it a little bit because I'm trying to say, well, if Ray thinks this is a good gig, if Scott thinks that this was a good gig, it's probably pretty good. So I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on some advice, uh, you know, from elder statesmen, if you will. Um, and then specifically trying to learn from a boss, you know, could turn into a mentor, a good, a good leader there. Um, and then from a product standpoint, like I didn't love looking for older, unsexy kind of, uh, markets, title kind of insurance industry, right? No innovation in 25 years, no modern competition whatsoever. So now all of a sudden I've got a modern product. That's the best product in the market and very little competition to go after. People don't build in that industry because it's a son of a bitch to sell to and building the product took years and it's super complicated. So there's this big moat around that industry. So I like these vertical specific kind of SaaS plays, um, in these kind of less sexy industries because there's a big, big win there. Um, so those are some of the things that I that I look for, you know, and on top of that, you try to learn what you can about the culture of the company, right? Try to figure out, you know, what people who work there say about the company to see if it's legit versus just a smoke screen. Those are some of the things that I'm looking for. Okay. <clears throat> you mentioned in that, the, a boss that can be a good mentor. And as soon as you said that, I thought back and that, that was a game changer for me early in my career. Like I, I got lucky. I had, I had a handful of just incredibly talented, great 
leaders that were teaching me that I was, you know, through osmosis, just catching, you know, some of, of what they were, they were dishing out. Um, where would you put that if you're, if you're shopping for the startups? Cause I, I'm, I'm not sure that I would, you know, be anywhere near where I am today without, without the help of, of a lot of those mentors early on, yeah. uh, where would you, where would you put that in the priority list for someone? And I, I'd rank it pretty high to be honest with you. I think it would. Um, again, because things are so transparent now, right? Like I can see a little bit about who you are and how you think and your philosophy on selling and management, just by reading all of your LinkedIn posts. So I can tell if, a little bit, if I'm going to vibe with this guy or this girl, right? I can tell if I listen to this podcast and, you know, uh, Katie is the RVP of sales or Nikki is the sales manager. And like, I would love to go work for, for her, right? I, she's got energetic personality that comes through in her podcast. Her posts are always super insightful and tactical. Like I can look at all that stuff. None of these platforms existed when I was coming up, right? There was no fucking LinkedIn. There's no podcasts, right? There's no blogs. There was nothing, right? So I just, I think it's super important. And it's, it's one of the great regrets of my career is that I had to learn all this stuff on my own. I did not have a bunch of mentors and good leaders around me. Yeah. The, the closest thing to the mentor I ever had was a sales trader who came into my first ever startup and made an impression upon me. And I just kind of stayed in contact with, and we're, we still talk, you know, to this day and, and it's the closest thing I've ever had to, to a mentor. And I didn't have it on a boss level whatsoever. I could have got better way faster, right? I could have avoided a lot of pitfalls and, and mistakes potentially. Um, I, I just think. I think people are making a mistake who don't put a lot of stock into who they're going to go work for. You know, I think people put too much stock into, oh, I really like this product, right? I really like this industry. I'm very passionate about that. For me, I don't care about that stuff as much. You know, I care about the opportunity and who I'm going to be around. That's what I'm thinking of. If I'm, if I'm getting started right now, I'm not somebody over here who's like, oh, I, I'm really passionate about marketing tech. I really want to work in mark tech. No, I'm a fucking mercenary. <laughs> Show me an industry and a product right for, you know, disruption. You used that word before, and let's go make it happen. That becomes exciting to me. That will lead me to be passionate about the product and what I'm doing, not the other way around. That's just me. That's how I think about it. Yeah. Um, it's certainly, you know, they've said, uh, they've said about culture, you know, the winning shapes the culture, you know, when you're, <clears throat> when your team is winning and you're, and you're racking up wins like that's, that tends to be, it's very difficult to build a really, a great culture in an environment where you're just losing. And so, like you said, like, if there's a great opportunity and, and you, you know, that's, you're going to find the passion, I imagine. Yeah. Um, you mentioned culture a, a, a little bit ago and what are your. What are your views on culture? If, you know, if you're, if you're to be sales, sales management role, you're not, not necessarily CEO. So you can't, you can't go write the core values necessarily, but, um, how do you shape a winning, healthy, productive culture in, in your view? Well, first of all, I think you have a responsibility to do so. And I think too many people kind of pawn it up on the CEO and say, Hey, it's not, not my culture. I'm just being my thing. Um, I, I feel a responsibility and on some level, a responsibility to create my own culture inside of the larger culture. Um, and for me, that starts with development It starts with giving a shit about my people. And my job is to help them get where they want to go. And that's going to be different for each person. How I get them there is going to be a little bit different. Um, and in, in order for me to show that I care and try to impact them and help them get where they want to go, I got to put in time. And in order for me to put in time, I got to be accessible. So I have to create a, you know, a transparent, open 
dialogue kind of environment where people can ask questions freely. They can, you know, get answers to things quickly that they're looking for. I've got to put in time to make sure I'm training people, I'm coaching them, I'm caring for them, I'm helping them succeed. That's where it all starts to me. And if the rest of the company doesn't have that culture, I can't necessarily control that when I can control my team and my department. And in my experience, if you create that environment and the rest of the company doesn't have it, your culture can bleed over in a good way and start to make a positive impact on the rest of the company. Uh, and so I see that in, in a sales centric kind of startup. Um, I see that as a core function of the role. <clears throat> I have found the, you know, for, for people that say culture has to roll downhill and I don't, I don't necessarily agree. It's harder to push it uphill, but it's, you know, it's, it, it doesn't necessarily have to roll downhill. And the one advantage I think sales always has is you're, it's easy to measure whether you're, you're doing a great job or not. And if you, if you're, if you, if you're a head of sales and you're trying to shape the culture and you're crushing your number, you tend to just, all right, well. Let him, let him do what he's doing, you know, and then you, and you continue to do that and you continue to rack up the wins, um, and you get a little bit more autonomy and you're right. You build this, you build a healthy subculture and it does absolutely bleed throughout the rest of the organization. Um, I've seen it, I've seen it happen. Um, the, you, how have you seen, I guess with startups specifically since the COVID thing for the past 12, 14 months, what changes are what important changes have occurred and, and what's, what's here to stay, if anything? Well, I think that, I think the biggest change and the thing that's here to stay is the adaptation to a, a remote workforce, specifically around sales. I can't tell you how many engineering and product teams have been able to work remote for God knows how long, but sales is never allowed to because it's like, oh, you can't trust salespeople to work at only old duty work. Well. I think what we've realized in the last year and a half or so is that's not true. And sales people and sales teams have thrived in many cases and companies have therefore thrived during a pandemic for God's sake. So I don't think that that's, uh, I don't think that pendulum is going to swing back too hard in the other direction, frankly, I really don't. I don't think you're going to find people willing to commute. 30 to 90 minutes each way every morning and every afternoon when they've had this taste of a different type of, of work life, you know, balance and environment, mm -hmm. right? People are getting more done because they're not in a car two hours a day. Mm -hmm. People are spending more time with their family, spending more time with their kids, exercising more, maybe right. Learning, taking on new products projects and, and creating, you know, side hustles and things like this for themselves. Um, why would I sign up to commute? Why would I sign up to go get on the fucking train every morning or go sit in rush hour traffic? So I think that companies who don't recognize that are going to have a really hard time with the talent wars coming soon. I think there's going to be a bit of a hybrid kind of switch. Where people are like, okay, you can work two, three days in the office, two, three days from home. And I think for a good while that will work because so many people are, are just starved for, you know, socialization. And there's a lot of people who are more productive, who are happier working from home. And I think that change is here to stay. Um, and it helps with recruiting. It saves tons of money for startups. The biggest overhead for a startup is office space. And people, if you're building a startup in New York city or San Francisco, you're trying to hire salespeople. It's expensive, mm -hmm. right? hundred and something dollars a square foot, hundred thousand dollars salaries. You don't have to do that anymore. You can hire salespeople from anywhere and save all the overhead. Uh, and I, I think that that's going to stay. I really do. I think that's going to stay for, for the good with that. How is building a, a remote sales team or managing a, a remote sales team? How is it different than in-person in the, in, I guess, in a, in a way of, if I used to have an in-person sales team for COVID, I went, you know, I did this, I tested this remote stuff, but we're, we're wanting to go back in the office. 
because I, because I've never managed a sales team remotely. And so it just kind of intimidates me. How are you going to hold them accountable? How are you going to build a culture? How are you going to, those things, if I've never done it before, what's your, what's your advice to, to building or leading a sales team remotely? Well, number one, there's a million people for you to talk to now who have just done this for over a year and get tips and tricks from, whereas pre COVID it was maybe, you know, a couple hundred, um, I think, you know, you, what you have to be aware of is like speed of response and accessibility has to be at an all time high. It's easy for me to walk in the office and say, Hey, Ray, I need to help this out. It's a lot harder when I have to text you or slack you to try to get your attention and then get you to respond to it. And then I have to be sitting there to read it as well. And I don't, I can't be distracted. So one of the things that, that I've told everybody is when your team messages you, you've got to be like, boom, you gotta be, you got a hawk eye, I think, which is tough because you feel like you're always on. Right. So my, my speed with responding to people, my quick ability to get blockers out of their way, uh, my sort of sanity and mental health checks on people, um, and my non-work conversation threshold is way higher than you know, it used to be, you know, in an office kind of in, environment, you know, a lot of, Hey, how you doing? What's going on in your life? How you handling this? How you doing that? Um, so there's a lot of, I think there's a lot more humanity involved a, in the remote kind of situation, training and, and, and onboarding people. You got to make sure you are not just throwing people to the wolves too soon. That, that was one of the things that held people back from hiring Yeah, was they didn't know how to retrain people remotely, right? Um, you don't want people sitting, watching a zoom call for eight hours, trying to learn stuff. So. It's got to be smaller groups. It's got to be interrupt, you know, breaks, interruptions, small focus kind of blocks and segments, utilize training tools like a lesson lead or, you know, those kind of things. Um, when I think that is a lot less hard than you imagine it, it to be, you know, and, and for every person who's arguing, we have, you miss all that energy on the, on the sales floor and all that kind of thing. I used to be in that camp too, but there was a lot of people who never liked all that energy and preferred, you know, their own quiet private space. Um, so, you know, as you're trying to build your team, like if it's a remote team, maybe optimize for people who like remote, who are not sort of whining for things to go back to the way that they used to be. Um, and then you'll have, you know, People are a little more comfortable with this kind of arrangement and environment now and, and are excited about it rather than frustrated with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you've had, I, I've actually shared a post that you wrote a while back, uh, on, on LinkedIn about the full cycle, the, like the full sales cycle versus the segmented say like the, you know, having the, having one person kind of go all the way through this versus, you know, SDR to AE to AM and. As opposed, like, I don't necessarily, not just to just reread it, but what are, can you, can you elaborate? What's your, what's your point of view on that? And, and can you give me a little background on, on, on yeah. what that is? Um, I have always had full cycle sales reps. I've never done the SDR AE model. Now, I think if you're selling something that is typically a six figure annual price tag or more. And you're in a long sales cycle or you're in enterprise sales. I can understand why the model works, but the predictable revenue SDRAE model was built for enterprise selling. It wasn't built for mid market or SMB or high velocity sales. So it just got blindly adopted and implemented at places where it made no sense. It complicated and elongated the sales cycle. It provided a crappy buying experience for people as they got handed over from one person to the next. It increased your customer acquisition costs. It increased your organizational complexity. Also, I have a fundamental moral issue with teaching somebody apart 
of what they need to do in their job and not all of it. If you're brand new to sales and you're telling me, I want to be a salesperson and I'm a teacher, my job is to teach you how to sell, not how to open. I don't want to teach you a piece of the pie. I don't like that. And as a teacher, that bothers me and it upsets me. And I consider myself a teacher. And then what happens is these people get pigeonholed in this role of SDR and they can't get out of it. Because, you know, they did an SDR successfully for six, 12, 18 months. They go try to, you know, be an AE somewhere else. And the company's like, well, you don't have any closing experience. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, I'm not, we're not going to hire you. I said, well, how the fuck am I supposed to get closing experience? When I'm an SDR and my current company doesn't give me a chance to close deals. Right? And so I think it holds people back. It has held people back in, in their career at times. Um, so for all of those reasons, I just never adopted it. I want my salesperson to research, to prospect, to run the demos, to close the deals. Once the deal is closed, I'm comfortable with them handing it over to somebody in account management, customer success. But if I'm running a, a hunting kind of team, I want them to do everything. I want them to know how to do everything. I think it's a better experience for them. I think it's a better experience for the buyers. Um, and I think there's economic reasons for it to make sense, uh, for the business and you know, it can be done. I just did it. Are those, <clears throat> I mean, and cause you, you're, you, I mean, you do the, the recruiting side of this. So you know a lot about the talent pool and how hard it is to find people at different levels. Is it, is it harder to find? specialized SDR, AE, AM type of roles, or is it harder to find a full cycle sales rep to go all the way through? See, what I would tell you now is it's harder to find people for full cycle because now you got all these AEs who are, uh, let's say lazy mm -hmm. or lazy early than they used to be because they've been spoon fed appointments. They've been spoon fed demos the whole time. They, they're all entitled and they're like, oh, I, I already prospected. I don't have to prospect anymore. So now how do I take this AE who spent the last five years having deals handed to him and opportunities handed to him by being supported by an SDR or two, as well as inbounds. And how do I tell them, Hey, you gotta run the whole cycle again. So it's hard now to find people willing to do that. Uh, and I didn't think that that's good for the profession. At all. And I, and I think that, um, I think that things will, will switch around a little bit. I think, I think, I think, I think change is coming a little bit on that, on that front. Yeah. It's hard to go back. I mean, when you, when you give somebody years of spoon fed demos and then, you know, and, and say, Hey, we, we want you to start making some, some calls and setting your own stuff. It's. It's very difficult to move, move somebody back once they've had that experience. Uh, yeah. you know, unless it's kind of forced upon them. Uh, you said earlier, uh, you said, you know, if you've, if you've failed 99 times at, you know, at, in sales, like if you've, if you've failed 99 times out of a hundred, you're still on your way to success, which it reminds me of, um, I don't know if you've read, uh, I think it's Annie Duke's, um, thinking in bets, you know, and she talks about the process versus results and mm -hmm. the, the example she uses that I always like to use is, is you know, if, if somebody drives home drunk and they make it home safely without killing anybody, it's still not a good decision. You know, the result was okay, but the process itself was still a terrible process. And I know your, your first, first book addicted to the process. Um, so I, I feel like there's you, you kind of probably subscribe to, to that, to a degree, yeah. but, but what inspired you to write addicted to the process and, and what are your, what are your thoughts on it? Well, there's, there's kind of three things. Um, number one, I have practiced process over results for a long time, all the way back to, you know, my athletic days. Oh, uh, and so I kind of wanted to hammer that home. Um, number two, I wanted to kind of tell my story a little bit and kind of what I had been through, um, sort of show people that, you know, if I can make it, anybody can do it basically. Right. Try to, try to be somewhat inspirational maybe and just show I'm, 
I'm nobody special. I don't come from anything special. And I figured it out saying, so can you. Um, and the last thing is, you know, I spent probably 75% of my career in SMB kind of more transactional selling environments. And I still, to this day, get pissed off when people tell me that that is not as hard as enterprise level selling. And so I felt like transactional sales has always been like a disrespected, you know, uh, faction of, of the sales community. Um, and I didn't like that. I never understood it. And people wouldn't produce content specifically for transactional selling. And that was the environment I was coming from. So I, I sort of saw a gap in the market and I'm like, well, why don't I write a book specifically to kind of help people who are just getting started in sales, which is where a lot of people end up is in transactional sales when they're just getting started and tell my story a little bit, make sure that people understand that process matters. And you know, it was the, it was the combining those three elements is, is what, you know, led to the production of the book. And if there was anything else, I'd say there's a couple people in my ear being like, you got to put this stuff on, on paper, Scott, and you got to take pen to paper, you know, you've been teaching it, training it for, for years, like get it done, you know, so I finally, finally made time to, to write it, you know, and I, I've been more than shocked with how well that it's done and, and been received and, and I'm just really grateful that people I resonated with it, you know? Mm -hmm. And how was that? So you're, I mean, your, your, your recent one from sales rep to, to manager is all, is a good one. And I would say <clears throat> a guide, I mean, it's a, it's a book, but it's like, it's a guide. Like if you're, if you're saying in a sales rep position, you're thinking about going into leadership, um, uh, from sales, sales rep to manager, I think is great too. How different was it writing the first one versus writing the second one for you? It's a lot different. You know, the, um, the first one is, is. There's a lot of philosophy and a, and a lot of, you know, why this works, why it's done this particular way. And as you said, the second book from rep to manager is like, this is what to do It's very tactical, very actionable. I feel like, um, and a guide to use your words. So stylistically it's quite different. Um, and then I, you know, I collaborated on book two, so that was helpful. You know, Ryan Walker is the, the co-author. He's the VP of sales at a company called Beyond Pricing. Um, so that was kind of fun. That lets in the burden a little bit, you know, you sharing ideas and, you know, marking each other's writing up and, you know, one person handles the artwork, one person handles the editing. It's like sharing your responsibilities. That's quite different. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say you have to be like perfectly aligned and partnered up, but like, if you and I are going to write something together, you know, you both want to be proud of what is, is coming out and people have different opinions and ideas. So there's something kind of special with, you know, forging a relationship like that and partnering up and, and producing something. Um, and one other difference is, you know, I didn't, I didn't print from rep to manager and we decided to make it an ebook only, a uh, digital only kind of book. Um, a little bit just for speed, you know, speed of production and, uh, kind of digestibility. And, you know, I, even my first book, Addiction to the Process, is like 90 pages, right? From rep to manager, I think is like, it would be like 63 if it was printed out, I think, uh, in the same kind of format and, and bound in the book. I'm a, I'm a get in, get out kind of guy. Like, I want you to be able to finish the book in an afternoon by the pool or like a, you know, if you fly from Baja to San Francisco, like you should be damn near able to finish the book in one flight, right? I don't got time for this 400 page novel of business books where somebody just repeats the same thing through different analogies, 500 times mm -hmm. and nobody got time for that shit anymore. Okay. So I tried to remove to just like all the fluff from, from both books, you know, and I, I have a third book coming out that kind of completes the trilogy, if you will, for me, which is all about being a VP of sales. Uh, it's called more than a number and, um, uh, should be out anytime if it's, it's finished and everything. And, um, that book is like 116 pages, maybe something like that. It was my longest, 
but even 116 pages is not very much, right? So my philosophy on, on, on the writing is like, get in, get out, be quick, be tactical, be inspirational, be helpful, um, and let people get on with their day. You know? Mentor mind said you can, most business books, if you read the first third of the first half, you've got it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, because so they, they took it to an agent and somebody said, yeah, it needs to be this many. And they just, you just start stretching it out and in, in different ways, but I would. Yeah. I, and I operate the opposite. This, this last book, the more than number book that I just finished when I wrote it, it was like 35,000 words. And I'm like, uh oh, my goal is to write like 11,000 words for this book. So I had to cut two thirds of what I wrote. It's hard. It's a hard process. It, 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 it forces you to look at things like, well, I don't need to say that. How can I say this shorter? I could cut this section here. This is all fluff. This is bullshit over here. I don't even remember what I was talking about here. Get rid of that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so is it interesting that that's, that has worked for me is to, to just kind of barf it all out onto the page and then trim it as it pays to try to keep it tight initially and then stretch it, as you said, that that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not in fifth grade anymore. Okay. My, my, my son's teacher is like, oh, would well, this need to be 500 words and you only wrote 320. What? You're going to punish him for getting to the point faster? No, I'm not here for that. Yeah. I had an English teacher in school that did, we had to do a report. And then the next week, the assignment was cut it in half. And then the next week was cut it in half again. And it, now that's, it was brutal. Um, I, that's more real life applicable in my opinion. Stuck with me. And it was, I mean, same English teacher was said, you know, why are you using such big words? Like you're trying to show off when like nobody understands that, you know? And so, uh, but yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people say no fluff, but I, I mean, your, your books kind of, well, I mean, all, your podcast, your messaging, it's, it's, it's like all the, none of the fluff, all the gruff. Or, <laughs> <laughs> That's a compliment. I think, right? It is. It is. It's a, it's a compliment. Somebody, somebody told me a, a while back that I, that I'm, I'm gruff at a time. It was me. I was that you who told me that? It was on an email and I said, you know, the word gruff comes to mind. You sent me back the definition. I went, oh. That sounds a little mean when I read it like that. <laughs> oh my God. That's terrible. It was you. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't read the definition before I sent it though. Oh, you know, that's its own brand for me. Right. <laughs> um, the, your, your approach to LinkedIn, like switching just a little bit from sales specifically, um, is a little bit different than, you know, what you would, like, it's not necessarily, it's not daily posting. It's not, but you have, a, I mean, you have a really engaged following. You have, um, I mean, you have a, you have a big following and a very engaged audience and you know, there's, there's a lot of different pieces of advice from, from people that I, I respect a lot, Dion. I'm just curious what you, what, what would be your answer to someone if you're a VP of sales or something and you say, I've got to develop, I, I, I buy it. I've got to develop a personal brand, but where do I get started? How do, should I be posting every day? I mean, how did you. How did you build your audience or what advice do you give that yeah. when I'm sure you're asked? I, I actually built my audience specifically to help me recruit. That was, that was the impetus for it. My, my, my thought process was I need to connect with every single person in sales, sales leadership, uh, every founder or CEO, basically anybody who I might hire or who might hire me one day, I need to connect with them. So the very first thing I did was build the size of my network app which is kind of intuitive to what everybody else tells you. Everybody else is like, oh, the size of your network doesn't matter and everything. Well, bullshit. It, it mattered a lot. And it helped me recruit. It helped me save hundreds of thousands of dollars in recruiting fees. And also helped me explain to my founders why I was spending time on LinkedIn building my brand. Because I was able to say, listen, I'm trying to save you all this money in recruiting, dude. So you don't have to hire a staffing firm. You don't have to hire an internal recruiter. Let me do my thing, get off my back. And they're like, all right, fine, fine, fine. Right. Um, and then I went from there to just kind of engaging with other people's content, right? So reading what they would write, you know, liking things, showing up in comments. And then I just said, all right, it's time to start. And, uh, it's going to be bad. I'm not going to be perfect. <laughs> I'm going to test this out. I'm going to test that out, see what happens. 
and I'm not going to be like everybody else. I'm going to speak my mind. Like who I am on LinkedIn is who I am on this podcast. Who I am in this podcast is who I am. That's all there is. Um, it gets me in trouble sometimes, but I think it differentiates me, you know? Um, and so I started talking about things that a lot of people don't want to talk about, whether it's how equity works and how it can kind of hose you if you don't know what you're doing, uh, how hard and brutal it is to be a VP of sales, how fucked up it is that founders fire you within 12 to 18 months all the time. Um, you know, racial and in, injustice issue, diversity issue. I talk about all these things, you know, pretty candidly. Um, but I, I also recognized in me that I'm not, a, I'm not a robot. I can't just sit down at a desk every single day and be like, this is my LinkedIn posting app. Okay. I don't operate like that. Like I am only posting things if the spirit compels me. Like if I'm not moved and something doesn't flow out of me, I don't rent. So I don't leave, I, you know, sometimes I'll post three, four days a week. Sometimes I'm not post once. It just depends. Do I have good ideas or not? Or do I have something to say? I don't use any kind of automation. I know a bunch of people at the top of the leaderboard on LinkedIn who plug things into buffer. They write their five posts for the week, every Sunday, boom, it goes out at 7 AM central every single day. Nope. I didn't do that. I know people who have spouses and admins and EAs who reply to, you know, comments and keep the engagement flowing and reply to DMs. Nope. I don't have a single person to do that. Anything I do is mine. And, and I, and I, I want it that way. I want it to be authentically me. Um, and I, I did that, you know, from the, from the start and over time now. I think it's distinguished me a little bit from, you know, the pack because a lot of people don't do it the same way as I do, which is what, which is what you said. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll leave one last thing for people who are thinking about getting started. Um, do not overthink it. Do not overthink it. Like I don't rewrite things. I don't edit. I don't agonize trying to make it perfect. You know, I get messages from my mom all the time. So that you misspelled these words here. <laughs> I really don't care about a misspelled word, right? Don't. Some of my best posts are things that I've had an idea while I'm driving. As soon as I get out of the car, I just post it on my phone. Sometimes I have an idea, you know, the night before and I didn't write it down and I go get in the shower in the morning and the idea comes back and boom, first thing I do is I sit down and I crank it out. And I have friends who struggle, who like put lots of energy and thought into what they write. And I'm like, man, just stop overthinking it. Just put it out there. If it doesn't do well, who cares? Nobody saw it if it didn't do well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, I, I'm a big believer in like shrinking the delta between idea and action. Like you have a good idea, just do it. Just execute on it. Don't overanalyze it. Don't overthink it. Don't find reasons not to do it. Um, so that's when I would say to people who are just kind of getting started, like, just, just start, don't overthink it. Just put something out there that you think will be helpful to people. Seems consistent with working in the startup world too. Mm -hmm. Like you've, you've got to move, take action. And you know, if, if you throw a post up and no one liked it, it's, it's a data point. All right. Got it. You know, if you're, if you're trying to optimize messaging, look at it and go, okay, that one was a bomb. Well, yeah. let's try something I'm different. Figure out why, you know? Yep. When I stylistically do it wrong, then I post it at the wrong day, the wrong time. Was the story boring? Right? Was it not engaging? What missed? Right? right. And a lot of times, you know, people don't get the engagement that they want because their network is tiny. So I always go back to just start with building a network. Mm -hmm. Just reach out to people and be like, hey, Ray, uh, big fan of your podcast. Love the episode with Scott the other day. Not looking to sell you anything, just want to connect with you and, and, you know, see if I can be helpful one day and, and hopefully I can continue learning from you. What are you going to be saying no to that connection request? Right. <laughs> yeah. I've found it's, it's a lot easier to connect with people when you just let them know no pitch is coming. 
like I say, no pitch coming, reaching out, saw this, you know, whatever it is, it's so long as you don't follow it up with a pitch, you know I mean? But if you're actually legitimately trying to connect with people and, and just building your network, tell them they'll, most people yeah. say, okay, that's fine. Yeah. I, I, I get messages sometimes, um, DMs in, in LinkedIn and somebody would say, Hey Scott, you know, been connected for years. Thanks for putting stamp out there. I had a question for you and I look at the message history. And the last message is from 2015 and it's my connection request to them saying every day, you know, looking to connect with sales leaders in Mexico, love what you're doing on the podcast, not trying to say anything, just want to learn from you. Let me know if I can ever be helpful. Hope we can connect. And I'm like, Damn, look at my message from 2015. <laughs> right. Thing is, you never know who might be able to help you. And you never know who you can help. So I don't subscribe to this theory of, oh, I have to know somebody in order to connect with them. No, you don't. No. Because that person that I hadn't even had a conversation with for five years, and apparently been getting value out of being connected with me and things that I write. And now the moment is right and they've reached out and I, and I never talked to them and I do my best to help. Yep. Well, I know we're, we're coming up on time and I want to make sure we, we hit on, uh, we come back to the, to the surfing piece, uh, you know, the, we can chat about surf and sales or where, where can people find you? Well, um, you, know, you should check out surfandsales.com at surfandsales.com, um, as well as the surf and sales podcast. We have two events in, uh, in November of 2021, one of them is sold out. The other one is almost sold out, but we'll have some in, uh, in 2022 as well. Um, make it by LinkedIn. Go ahead, ready. I said maybe in Baja. Yeah, maybe in Baja. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm super responsive there. Um, also every Thursday night, I host Thursday night sales with my co-host, Jamie Bolas. It's a Zoom virtual sales happy hour where we answer questions from people around the world and and just kind of hang out, have some laughs and, and some fun. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a lot of other places, but I'll just, I'll just stop at those two. If you want to, if you want to catch me there, you can find me there. If you want to, you know, hang out and get some private trainings and events and things like that, you could also join my Patreon group. And um, we do these fun events called Tequila Tuesdays. I have guests come in and, and talk to everybody. So those are the three best ways probably to get a hold of. Okay, cool. And the Patreon group, I mean, for anybody listening, I'm a member of it and it is legit, I mean, vastly more value than what you're paying to be part of there every week. You have a, you have a great you speaker. Add another zero onto your monthly fee, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll pay it. It's uh, like even <laughs> early, early, earlier this week was a, was a really great one. Um, we'll follow up yeah. on that, but I, thanks for your time, man. I'm really glad to, to have you on the podcast. Look forward to, to chatting with you a little bit more and, um, Really, really appreciate your time and your and your insights here. Yeah, man, it was a lot of fun. Thank you.